Thank you. Um, I'd like now to begin by welcoming everyone here, uh, our distinguished guests, colleagues, students, staff, everyone to the William James Lecture for 2011 on Religious Experience. Uh, over the past two years, we've tried different formats for the lecture, uh, something new in the history of this institution, uh, that is the institution of the lectureship. Uh, last year's event was in the Houghton Library. Many of you were perhaps there in conjunction with the William James exhibit that we had at that time in the libraries. And this year, we're having a luncheon lecture with responses and discussion, uh, rather than the usual evening lecture of the past. Also, for the first time, in addition to being videotaped for our website, the lecture is also being webcast simultaneously, uh, and I want uh, also here to welcome our viewers uh, on your computers, wherever you may be. Finally, because of the large number uh, of guests today, we also have an overflow room down the hall in Andover 102, where the lecture can also be seen and heard. Uh, on this occasion, I want to say just a few words before turning the lectern over about the lecture and the benefactor who enabled us to have the William James Lecture on Religious Experience at the Divinity School. In 1968, the money to endow the, the James Lectures uh, here was given to HDS by the John Lindsley Fund, which had been established by Thayer Lindsley. Thayer Lindsley, one of the 20th century's most prominent developers in the mining world, uh, was born on August 17, 1882, of American parents in Yokohama, Japan. When he was 15 years old, the family returned to the United States and settled in Milton, Massachusetts. Thayer studied civil engineering here at Harvard and graduated with an A.B. in 1903. He made his first mining profits in the Pacific Northwest and Northern Ontario in the early 1920s. At the height of his career, Lindsley held the presidency of 10 different mining companies and was widely known in the field of mining until his death in 1976. His longstanding interest in William James as a teacher and in James's religious ideas made it seem appropriate to the trustees of the John Lindsley Fund that these lectures in honor of William James with particular reference to James's book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, should be established as a lasting memorial both to Lindsley and to the great American philosopher and psychologist whom he so admired. On October 14th, uh, 1970, 41 years ago, the Divinity School inaugurated the, the annual lecture, uh, this annual lecture series, rather, the William James Lectures on Religious Experience, with an address by Cushing Strout, professor of English and American Studies at Cornell University. It was entitled Morbidity, Mind Care, and Methodism, uh, the Varieties of Religious Experience. Uh, our speaker today, Arthur Kleinman, a valued colleague from Harvard, is the only William James lecturer, I might note, to offer the James lecture for a second time during his long and distinguished career here. Uh, so it's a particular honor uh, to be able to introduce the lectures today, knowing that Arthur will be giving them. I'm now going to turn the podium over to our uh, Dean for Academic Af and Faculty Affairs here at the Divinity School, Jane Eidelman Smith, to introduce to Arthur and our respondents. So, Jane, I'm going to give it to you now. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see everybody here. Let me uh, just say a word about format. Uh, after the lecture, we will have two respondents whom I will introduce briefly uh, just before they speak. Uh, feel free, please, to eat your lunches. We tried to give you non-crackly, non-crunchy things so there wouldn't be too much disturbance. And if you think to bring your box out afterwards and put it in a trash container, it would help our staff uh, very much. At the end, we hope that we will have an opportunity for you all to have some conversation and exchange uh, with our guest speaker. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Arthur Kleinman, who has been at Harvard in a variety of capacities for the last, I believe it's 35 years, and he's really among the best known personages in the university. You all know that, that's why you're here. He's a graduate of Stanford University Medical School and has a master's degree in social anthropology from Harvard. Uh, he trained in psychiatry at Mass General Hospital. 
Now, looking over the pages of resume of Arthur Kleinman, it's very difficult to pick out a lot of things, and he asked me to keep this fairly short, so I will try uh, to do that. Let me say that he holds these positions currently. He is the Esther and Sidney Robb Professor in the Department of Anthropology. He is Professor of Medical Anthropology in Global Health and Social Medicine and Professor of Psychiatry, Harvard Medical School, and the Victor and William Fung Director of Harvard University's Asia Center, just to get you started. His fields then include medical anthropology. He inaugurated Harvard's first PhD program in this field, cultural psychiatry, global health, social medicine, and medical humanities. He has conducted field research, among other places, in China and Taiwan. Arthur Kleinman won the first Franz Boas Award of the American Anthropological Association, which is its highest award, in 2001. He has twice given the Distinguished Lecture at the National Institutes of Health. A former Guggenheim Fellow, Kleinman has been clevering, clevering a professor at the University of Leiden and Royal Society Visiting Professor at the University of Hong Kong. He's the author of a number of books, co-author and editor of many, many more, uh, and has numerous uh, special issues of journals, articles, book chapters, and so forth. In 2011, and this is very special, Arthur Kleinman was appointed to the honorific position of Harvard College Professor and received the 2011 Harvard Foundation Distinguished Faculty Award. It's very difficult to select from among his many writings, but I wanted to just mention a few that seem to me particularly relevant to today's lecture. And these go back a bit and some of them more recent. What really matters? living a moral life amidst uncertainty and change. Writing on the margin, discourse between anthropology and medicine. Rethinking psychiatry from cultural category to personal perspective. The illness narratives, suffering, healing, and the human condition. His most recent book is entitled Deep China, the Moral Life of the Person, What Anthropology and Psychiatry Tell Us About China Today. In 2010, he contributed an article to a book edited by R. Donald Swearer entitled Caregiving, The Divided Meaning of Being Human and the Divided Self of the Caregiver. Arthur Kleinman is familiar to many of us at HDS, as Bill said, for delivering the William James Lecture in 1997, and we couldn't resist the opportunity to have him come back. He will lecture today on the unfulfilled, yet not unfulfillable, quest for moral wisdom in academic life, while, why William James still matters. Please welcome Professor Dr. Kleinman. Well, um, I'm going to read this uh, lecture, so bear with me, and please eat your lunches, and I'll try to keep my voice loud enough so you, 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 you can follow. Um, first of all, I, I dedicate this to my late wife, Joan Andrea Kleinman, 4 September 1939 to 6 March 2011. And I begin it with a poem. This is Mary Oliver's In Black Water Woods, the American from her American Primitive, just a part of it, where she says, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes, to let it go, to let it go. I have had the high honor and the practical yet distinct benefit of delivering the William James Lecture, as you've heard, not once but twice. In 1997, together with the Tanner Lecture I presented some months later at my alma mater, Stanford, it provided me with the legitimacy to extend the angle of my perspective beyond medicine and to provide a theory of experience that served me well over at least a decade of intellectual labor in medical anthropology, global health, China studies, and the medical humanities. If today's talk proves even partially as useful, It'll be an aid to this, the final stage of my intellectual career. What I seek to essay now is the quest for wisdom, 
that at one point or another of crisis and loss figures large in the lives of many worldwide. I recognize that this search for wisdom takes different forms and significance, whether it is structured within an orthodox collective religious framework or a highly subjective search for moral meaning in the more secular intellectual and moral economy of literature and philosophy. Either way, however it becomes part of the practical, painstaking art of living that people everywhere fashion as the existential core of human conditions, it is, it is key. So where does that quest fit into academic life? A scientist might respond, I, I have plenty of friends who would respond this way, it doesn't fit, it is not appropriate for academia. But I sense that many humanists and interpretive social scientists believe it should be, and often is, part of academic discourse. And I think many clinicians and religionists would agree. William James clearly thought that the search for knowledge to assist the art of living is at the very core of what, of, of what, a, of what a life of ideas should be about and what the university is here for. I began my own life of the mind in the confines of a Jewish enclave, an upper middle class circle in New York in the 1940s and 50s. By the 1960s, a combination of forces, a university-based liberal education, a medical career, marriage outside my faith community to a life partner from a Protestant European background, introdu introduction to Chinese culture as the core of my research and moral career, and wide reading in literature, philosophy, and social theory had set me on my road less traveled by. That road passed through the first of two crises in my life that made a quest for wisdom, not just any meaning, crucial. I will review that quest and its two crisis points, more or less as I've set it out in a Lancet article uh, in November last uh, that I provided as background reading to a number of people here, including my commentators. My intention is to ask what we learn more generally from such a quest for wisdom that illumines the place of meaning, practices, and vulnerabilities, aspirations in ordinary lives. Having recently essayed, based on field research, quest for meaning in China today, I will claim that my conclusions are more than parochial in, in speaking and speak to an existential stream in our human condition. By the way, <clears throat> I prefer the term human condition or conditions to human nature because determining what precisely constitutes human nature is so ideologically divisive and unclear, whereas among the myriad of possible ways of living, there appear to be only a relatively limited number of empirically documented states that define our human condition. Among them are love, loss, intellectual and moral aspiration, and failure. The ones pertinent to this talk, of course, there are many others. And, this, and if this is what human experience is about, surely it must have a place in knowledge generation and transmission in the academy. Perhaps its broader significance, in fact, is to reclaim, following William James, the idea that a practical contribution to living is inseparable from what a university should be about. In my late 20s, during those years when I served as a US Public Health Service officer and NIH fellow stationed in Taiwan, that was 1969 to 1970, I kept a journal that was filled with pithy quotations from the reading I was then doing of early 20th century continental philosophers, including Bergson, Diltai, Husserl, Merleau-Ponty, Cassira, and Ortega Gasset, among others. There were also in those pages the words of American pragmatists, especially John Dewey and William James. I, re I reopened the scarred, yellowed pages of the journal and reread those short excerpts again in spring 2011, following the death of my wife and collaborator, the sinologist Joan Kleinman, with whom I had loved and lived for almost half a century. I was experiencing uncontrollable memories of our past together, while struggling to come to terms with a great sadness, oscillating with aching yearning that felt like a heavy stone was weighing down my soul. In those early weeks of loss, I was devastated and quite literally lost. Focusing on the journal's oracular entries, I knew even then was probably going to be a largely unsuccessful attempt to sublimate unmasterable feelings of grief. On rereading these philosoph philosophical selections, 
I became acutely, even embarrassingly aware that 43 years before, I had also been on a failed quest to go beyond what intellectual authority and legitimacy these statements could offer for practical wisdom about how to live. At that earlier time, I needed to have my own cohate ideas, which had begun to feel overreaching and unreal, supported by a lineage of thought. I needed an intellectual and, in another sense, moral foundation. In 1969, I was about to make what I knew would be a decisive turn away from the laboratory and the primary care clinic that would carry me back to the humanities, which had been my undergraduate academic home, and head toward anthropological fieldwork and psychiatric practice, the uncertain consequences of which I could barely appreciate other than as aspiring and anxious dreams. I had come to feel stifled and frustrated, and I wanted wisdom to furnish my career and animate my life with a compelling agenda, a great idea, and a means of calming the unsettling restlessness that I felt, which returned at the time I read the journal following Joan's death. If I've managed to confuse you about the two so different eras, that confusion is what I too experienced. I needed in both periods reassurance, confirmation that the very grounds of who I was and what I was doing were real, stable, and appropriate for a professional intellectual career and for the deep subjectivity of my life. I had set out in 1969 to rethink medicine as a cultural phenomenon, an illness as suffering, a moral experience. I knew others thought this approach to health and medicine as questions in the development of a grounding social theory to be fantastically presumptuous and even impossible. And following Joan's death, I was back in the seething, incohate morass of my feelings, agitated and obsessed by the absence of clear markers and by something much bigger, the loss of something so miraculous, so definitive, I could not imagine getting through the rest of life without it. The all-absorbing love I had for my wife and she for me had more than sustained me and her through those uncertain years of building a professional life, a family, and our own world. That fierce and joyful love had animated those years, now gone forever, with a golden you that expressed a shared sensibility of things being right and good and beautiful. During the terrible years of Joan's descent through neurodegeneration to blindness, dementia, paralysis, and a slow death, love had made it possible to endure the unendurable. It had motivated my caregiving and her care receiving. No wonder I went back to find something of that earlier time that I could hold on to and be inspired by, or at least work with. The basic reality is my life, Ortega y Gasset. The historical categories of value and purpose grow out of lived experience, Diltai. Meaning and significance rise only in man and his history, for man is something historical, Diltai. To endure means to change, to grow, to become, Bergson. Whatever is real has a meaning, Oakshot, and so on for the quotations go on and on for dozens of densely written pages. I had, and still have, an affinity for philosophers concerned with phenomenological reality and existential themes. These philosophers were appealing to me in part for highly personal reasons, and in part because they were a bridge to social theorists like Max Weber and Pierre Bourdieu and Peter Berger, whose work I used to develop my own theories of illness experience social suffering, stigma, and medicine as a moral enterprise. Creating a file of congenial philosophers whose insights I found attracted, attractive led to a now abiding sensibility that theory matters, not mainly for the sake of ideas, but principally because it illuminates, makes coherent, and redirects empirical studies and their practical implications so that there are real effects in the world that are original and against the grain practical effects that remake and repair the world. Of course, working with philosophical positions and arguments fit my temperament and the de deep desire I have held since adolescence to be intellectuals, intellectually serious and to be taken by others as such. It had formed both the professional and domestic conversations Joan and I built. What philosophical insights didn't do for me was to offer up the deep wisdom I was searching for 
first in 1969 and once again in 2011. Neither in understanding my career crisis nor in appreciating the joys and pains of love nor still in making sense of the existential body blow of loss did these writers and their ideas offer a wisdom that I could apply to grapple with disappointment and defeat. Of course, to be fair, neither did religious writings and practices, poetry, or any other source code offer me help in this way. The quest itself, I now see, could not but fail. The cultural expectation could not be advanced, nor the private one realized, because the object of inquiry was wrong. It wasn't understanding life as perception, nor illness as symbol, not even medicine as cultural form that mattered at these times of crisis. I can't even say that moralists, from Michel de Montaigne to Albert Camus, and from Mencius to Du Wei Ming, with whose rightfully famous works I've spent so many hours, which were otherwise so helpful in making me realize that experience is always and everywhere a moral condition of what is most at stake for individuals among the uncertainties and dangers of ordinary life. I cannot even say that moralists fulfilled what I was most after. I wish to see my own subjectivity, self, sensibility, commitments, will, experienced not as moral theory, but as authorizing feelings and values that could sustain my engagement in the world and connect me to others who matter to me. Hence, my deep subject was not experience as a philosophical problem, albeit that was not ir irrelevant. It was experience as practice that I was after. And such practice is always about action among others, upon others, best of all, for others. And that practice is the very art of living. It is through mentoring and caregiving as doctor and teacher that I've come closest to finding the object of my quest for wisdom. It is also what I was seeking so unsuccessfully in what I would now call my romantic reading of important thinkers, which William James referred to as a quest for, quote, the strangely moving power of passages, irrational doorways as they were, through which the mystery of fact, the wildness and pang of life, stole into our hearts and thrilled them, end quote. My search for a wisdom had been a largely unfulfilled quest, but as in the case of caregiving, not an unfulfillable one. And it is here that William James, whom I would remind you, Alfred North Whitehead once called the only truly original American philosopher, has been especially important to me. My reading of James's extraordinary prose, filled with resonant images, mobilizing cadences, and striking metaphors, and alive with his vulnerable yet robust humanity, invited a freedom of interpretation and dialogical flights of ideas and feelings that have given me over four decades a large happiness and strong significance. I needed someone with some set of useful ideas not to free me up, not to free up within me my own music, but to co-create that music in a long-term dialogue through a creative back and forth from metaphor to rhythm of words to findings from experience, to major conclusions relevant to my life. I needed an intellectual interlocutor who could come right down into my experience and illuminate it from within. It could have been Montaigne or Shakespeare and other strong poets. For me, it was the author of the varieties of religious experience and the great principles of psychology. James spoke, I felt the words strike home in some uncanny and yet not unordinary way James shoved me. It was not exactly what he said, nor some specific answer he provided to my originating questions, but rather a feeling that emerged from the exchange that for me mattered most and that propelled me along my way. Here's William James from the Varieties of Religious Experience. Quote, if this life be not a real fight in which something is eternally gained for the universe by success, it is no better than a game of private theatricals from which one may withdraw at will. But it feels like a real fight, as if there was something really wild in the universe which we, with all our idealities and faithfulnesses, are needed to redeem. Or again, this time from talk to teachers. The solid meaning of life is always the same eternal thing the marriage, namely, of some unhabitual ideal 
however special, with some fidelity, courage, and endurance, with some man's or, women, or woman's pains. I had in my memory my wife's living death mask, the fine skin pulled tight across her high cheekbones, her unseeing eyes, her final breaths, and the feeling that I was floating away, no longer anchored. I had a real fight on my hands and in my being. The wisdom I needed came out of my readiness to respond to James pushing at a certain time when I was faced with a problem central to the human condition, a problem that connected me up with the grain of life and with the existential uncertainty of our being. And that fostered a feeling of recognition and recovery. And that, and that is how it perhaps always works. Wisdom needs to be experienced to be effective and is effective not as an idea, but as a lived feeling and a moral practice that redeems our humanness amidst inevitable disappointment and defeat. Perhaps just so does our readied response at times of deep trouble and anguish to paintings, music, and works in the humanities redeem the felt moral experience of the doctor and the patient in the family. I am here, all three, of course. While the impossible fight over life goes on and the quest for wisdom remains ordinarily unfilled, yet over time not unfillable. All of which brings me to religion. Some years ago, I co-taught a course entitled Religion and Medicine with a distinguished former faculty member of Harvard Divinity School, Sarah Coakley. Half the students came from the Harvard Divinity School and half came from the Harvard Medical School. For the medical students to a person, William James's understanding of religion as based in psychological processes was convincing. It will come as no surprise to this audience that the perspective was deemed as entirely inadequate by divinity school students, for whom its failure to pay attention, serious attention, to theology, religious institutions, and the work of religionists rendered the Jamesian perspective deeply suspect. James's universalist orientation also came in for their criticism, because as Talal Assad, a distinguished anthropologist of religion now at the CUNY Graduate Center, argues, these students recognized partisan commitments as central to what makes most religions religion. I'm not here to defend James. He needs no defenders. The mere fact that the varieties of religious experience remains widely read and taught 100 years after William James's death speaks for itself. Also, from an anthropological point of view, James's understanding of religious subjectivity needs to be updated and seen as having to go beyond the deep interiority of faith, commitment, and habit to include the interpersonal practices of ritual, presence, and embodiment, which James tended to see largely as individual behaviors rather than the collective moral practices they most decidedly are. Yet I do want to build on James's emphasis to relate religion to quest for wisdom. In my 2011 co-authored book, Deep China, my students, former students and I, examined various quests for meaning in China uh, and among the Chinese today. Clearly one of the most urgent is the quest for what some Chinese call spiritual meaning. Six decades under communism, which some Chinese sardonically define as the longest and most painful road to capitalism, including most recently powerful market reforms that are central to the global economy, has brought China prosperity, but also deep social and health disparities, as well as cynicism about both traditional Confucian values and contemporary ethics. Not surprisingly then, there's been a great upswelling of popular interest in Buddhism, Christianity, and especially among minorities, Islam. By and large, this movement has not been characterized by theological passions for theory, nor even by a Chinese version of theodicy, but rather by the most practical involvement with rituals, presence, and embodiment. And there is also intensified interest in the consequences of religion for societal values, business ethics, professional standards, and policy regulations. Amazingly, during the era of the most rapid economic expansion experienced by any country on Earth, China actually hosted several national debates on the meaning of life in a world dominated by over-materialistic, consumerist, and hyper-individualistic interests. 
Questioning ultimate political authority was not tolerated, of course, but the normally repressive regime allowed and even enabled the national debate on the existential human condition. That existential human condition is grounded in social suffering owing to catastrophes that upend life, that upend life plans and intimate relations, by structural violence that injures especially those with marginal resources who are least protected in societies worldwide, and by serious troubles of everyday life that affect in each and every one of us owing to chronic illness, aging, and the multiple vulnerabilities that make life everywhere uncertain and insecure. In the face of this universal human condition, people turn to religion, along with other sources of wisdom I have mentioned. Theodicy looms large here, especially for the intellectually oriented, but so do does the very practical quest for trying to exert greater control over the exigencies and conditionalities I've described. The quest for wisdom, ethnographies and social histories suggest, is an attempt to normalize, cope, and sustain resilience through the art of living, a truth that William James emphasized, not just in the varieties, but in the great psychology and much of the rest of his writing. He saw religion, like philosophy, as a resource for getting through life. It was a means of strengthening men and women for the unequal and unwinnable struggle against our common fate and destiny. Religion for James also meant fortifying us not to be afraid of life. How religion is made use of in this way is not necessarily how the scholars of religion interpret texts and rituals. And yet without this popular dimension of the human uses of religion, religious traditions and commentaries would lose, lose much of their capacity to mobilize individuals and groups and to animate processes, processes of repair, restitution, healing, and redemption. Hence, this subject needs to become a more serious source of interdisciplinary academic discussion that bridges the study of religion, the social sciences, and humanities, as well as the helping professions. Indeed, I would argue it is precisely this side of religion that can connect a university such as ours and its programs to broad interest in religious quests for meaning in our society and worldwide. In this short talk, I only have time to open this central question for discussion. In my own way of thinking, this is where religion, medicine, and teaching come together. Because the quest for wisdom in the art of living is as central to caregiving as it is to mentoring and to the acts of service in moral and religious life. William James knew this, as do many moralists and religious practitioners today. It is we, the academic community of scholars, who need to rediscover this quest at the center of what it means to be human for what it is. Perhaps the most universal and defining quality of moral and religious experience, a quality that doesn't just persist in our times, but continues to animate the deep sensibility of the modern person as much as the moral common sense and ways of life of social networks and communities. Against the cruel and cold indifference of the universe, from the deepest anthropological understanding, we see men and women humanize life by first creating or discovering God, gods, then by materializing that creation or discovery into a force in the world, and finally by questing for wisdom. As William James and his brother Henry too knew it to be, the longing after and the struggle to master ways of living amidst real danger and great uncertainty realizes what is most at stake in life, namely, not just enduring, but creating and sustaining lives of purpose and significance, tested by failure, disappointment, betrayal, and loss, yet still buoyed by resilience, love, and often unfulfilled but not unfulfillable journeys for practical meaning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me very briefly introduce our two respondents. Professor David Carrasco is the Neil L. Rudenstein Professor of the Study of Latin America at Harvard Divinity School. 
This is a joint appointment with the Department of Anthropology and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. He is editor-in-chief of the award-winning three-volume Oxford Encyclopedia of Mesoamerican Cultures. His most recent work is the history of the conquest of New Spain. He is the winner of the Mexican Order of the Aztec Eagle, Mexico's highest honor given to a foreign national. Professor Kimberly Patton is professor of the Comparative and Historical Study of Religion at HDS. She is the author of The Sea Can Wash, Modern Marine Pollution and the Ancient Cathartic Ocean. Her latest book, Religion of the Gods, Ritual, Paradox, and Re Reflexivity, won the 2010 American Academy of Religion Book Award for Excellence in Religious Studies. So I welcome both of you. Uh, David, will you begin? I want to thank the uh, Divinity School and Arthur Kleinman for the special opportunity to participate in this year's William James Lecture event. I make note, building on Dean Jane Smith's description of today as a kind of dialogue, that this is the second time this year at HDS where an academic event, traditionally a monologue, has been in, in, turned into not a dialogue, but what I call a trialogue. I refer to the opening convocation in September when Elizabeth Schuster of Fiorenza asked Jacob Alupana and I to join her, transforming a traditional way of acting in academia into, to borrow Professor Kleinman's prose, quote, something original and against the grain, end of quote. Given Professor Kleinman's insistence on, in his words, again, of seeing the search for wisdom in the art of living as always, quote, about action, among others, upon others, and best of all, for others, it is fitting that we are all together today with you. What I'm going to do is uh, just give you a little tour of my journey through this uh, essay, um, uh, which was part of my attempt to understand what I call the Arthur Kleinman state of mind, and then ask some questions to Arthur and to you that may help in the discussion. Titles mean a lot to me, and they mean a lot to Arthur Kleinman as well, as we learn from not only some of his book titles, and let me read a couple of them again, what really matters, living a moral life amidst uncertainty and danger, the illness narratives, suffering, healing, and the human condition, and writing at the margin, discourse between anthropology and medicine, but none of these titles are more interesting and challenging for me than the title of this lecture, an unfulfilled but not unfulfillable search for wisdom. And I haven't even gotten to the subtitle yet, which in the version that I was given was The Art of Living with Love, Loss, Aspiration, Failure, and Other Existential Realities of Our Human Condition. I like this title for two reasons. First, it reminded me of some of those long, wonderful titles of books and articles one found in the 18th and 19th century, when authors weren't, authors weren't afraid to run a train of words across the title pages <laughs> to let you know you were in for a real ride to somewhere you'd never been before. But the second reason is because of the challenge of the phrase unfulfilled but not unfulfillable. A close reading of this essay finds an unusual number of words with the prefix un. Besides unfulfilled and unfulfillable, Kleinman is thinking about unsuccessful, unmasterable, uncertainty, uncontrollable, unendurable, signaling to us his own sense of loss in remembering his marriage to Joan Kleinman, quote, something so miraculous, so definitive, a fierce and joyful love. The title and the challenge of the piece made me think of the teaching power of Zen koans. Zen koans are sayings, questions, or dialogue that can't be figured out by rational thinking, but only through feeling, intuition, 
and thinking along the edges and the undersides of words and meanings. As it is with the question, you've heard the sound of two hands clapping, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Or when the seeker asks the master, how can I know the true path of everyday life? And the master answered, if you want to reach the true path beyond doubt, place yourself in the same freedom as the sky. Zen koans usually originate in the lives of sages or legendary figures like William James and perhaps Arthur Kleinman. And to get the true meaning or the saying or of a dialogue, you must use feeling through intuition and thinking along the edges and undersides of words and meanings. Because it's really about the states of mind that one comes to and achieves in this quest. Kleinman's mind, his state of mind is about unfulfilled, but not unfulfillable. Trying to plumb more about Arthur's state of mind at this moment of loss and discovery with all these unwords, I ran to the Oxford Dictionary, the short one, and discovered that the prefix un not only expresses negation or privation of something, it points us to a major linguistic preoccupation of English-speaking humans, because the first language, the first entry after un, is followed by no less than 18 columns of unwords covering six pages. And that's just in the short Oxford English Dictionary. Because this un that Kleinman is talking about is trying to get us to face up to what he calls the body blows of loss and crisis that are fundamental to our existence in humans. Reading on in Kleinman, we learn why he uses these words because he's thought a lot about and insists upon we take action in the face of what you heard him call the human condition. He writes, by the way, I prefer that human condition or conditions over human nature because determining what precisely constitutes a human nature is so ideologically divisive and unclear. Whereas among the myriad of possible ways of living, there appears to be only a relatively limited number of empirically documented states that define our human condition, end of quote. Later in the paper, he gives us this unlovely description of our condition, for he will not let us off this uncomfortable and unruly existence, quote, that existential human condition is grounded in social suffering owing to catastrophes that upend life plans and intimate relations, structural violence that injures especially those with marginal resources who are the least protected in societies worldwide, and the serious troubles of everyday life that affect each and every one of us, owing to chronic illness, aging, and the multiple vulnerabilities that make life everywhere uncertain and insecure. I realize I'm repeating what you heard, but it's, it's, it's worth it. At some moments in my tour of Arthur Kleinman's state of mind, the work of the Spanish writer Miguel de Unamuno came to mind, and especially his famous book, The Tragic Sense of Life. Miguel de Unamuno, who in his novel Abel Sanchez has the hero speak of a fundamental choice facing humans in deep crisis, we either love or we die. How close, dear Arthur, have you come in your journey to this day to also embracing a tragic sense of life? Unamuno said it this way, my religion is to seek for truth in life and for life in truth, even though I know I shall not find them while I'm alive. He said, among men of flesh and bone, there have been typical examples of those, those who possess this tragic sense of life. And he lists Marcus Aurelius, St. Augustine, Pascal, Rousseau, Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard. And he said, this tragic sense of life, quote, burdened them with wisdom rather than with knowledge. My reflection on your quest then took me further to the work of Peter Homans, a book called The Ability to Mourn, Disillusionment and the Origins of Psychoanalysis. Homans sees psychoanalysis as a cultural interpretive movement originated as a creative response to the withering away of traditional communities and their symbols and the loss of valued attachments. 
Homan saw the multiples, that the multiple social crises of Europe shoved, a word that Arthur Kleinman likes, shoved Sigmund Freud, but also Carl Abraham, Carl Jung, Otto Rank, Melanie Klein, and many others to use introspection to develop what Hume, Homans calls the ability to mourn, the ability to face up and fight with the legacies of losses, and like Kleinman, to create new practices for healing self and others. Are you, Arthur, talking about an ability to mourn in a more active social sense, linking religion, medicine, and teaching together? And here my thinking drifted to the work of my colleague Stephanie Paulsell and others, whose book, The Scope of Our Art, The Vocation of the Theological Teacher, may set the stage for even future dialogues. Now because of my nature or my condition, I always look at things spatially, even essays. I look for centers and peripheries in an argument, in an interpretation. And in a way, the physical center of this essay is an object, the journal Arthur started keeping in his 20s with these pithy quotations, and he gave you the list of some of those authors. He was looking for something, and I like this phrase, quote, to furnish my career, students, listen up, to furnish my career and animate my life with a compelling agenda, to know that the very foundations of who I was and what I was doing were real, stable, and appropriate, end of quote. Arthur, in times of great crisis and learning, ruminates back to this journal, and he brings to our students at HDS a piece of wisdom about the need to read and do theory. He writes that this work of copying philosophers, quote, led to a now abiding sensibility that theory matters, not mainly for the sake of ideas, but principally, principally because it illuminates, makes coherent, and redirects empirical studies and their practical implications so that there are real effects in the world that are original and against the grain practical effects that remake and repair the world. I read that to encourage those students who are coming to method and theory next semester to come with a good attitude. <laughs> My search for the center of Kleinman's state of mind led me, however, not to an object as a thing or an object as an idea, but to an object which is a process, an ongoing, unfinishable process of what he calls a quest for deep wisdom about the art of living, quote, it was the experience as practice that I was after. To bring the words of the background hero, William James, into the story, here, is, here he is in 1907, quoted, by the way, in the book by Homans that I just referred to. James said, quote, ideas become true just so far as they help us to get into satisfactory relations with other parts of our experience. And the practice that Kleinman seems to have in mind is not only, and this I think is an important nuance of the, of the essay, it's not only caregiving, he talks about the need of care receiving. And it might be useful to have him talk to us a little bit more, how love can also allow people to receive care when you're vulnerable and weak and afraid. Another question for you. What else, who else besides James really grabbed you? Really grabbed you? If we had to take those five books with us to the proverbial desert island, which one should I take, Arthur? Among the other parts of experience, and I'm coming to the end, that are so important to Arthur Kleinman, as stated in these pages, is feelings. Note that in his search for experience as practice, he comes back again and again to the word feeling. Feeling is important in helping him rethink illness as suffering. Feeling enables him in relating philosophy to social theory. Crucial to the quest for wisdom was finding, quote, authorized feelings and values that could sustain me. He writes, wisdom needs to be experienced to be effective and effective not as an idea but as a lived feeling. And there is, to me, in this essay, a remarkable religious image about the generation of feeling. It comes in his reflections on his dialogues with James, 
But it's not an image of a teacher and a student on opposite ends of a log exchanging words. It's an image of what we in religious studies call imminence. Quote, I needed an intellectual interlocutor who could come right down into my experience and illuminate it from within. We might call that a possession. Can you say more about this dimension of feeling to us and their relations to moral practice? These feelings we're told often related to ideas help in what is so important toward the end of this essay, and that's the image of a fight. The fight in the search for wisdom. Toward the end of this essay, he speaks of this fight as needing a series of bridges between three things that he emphasizes, medicine, teaching, and religion. Bridges have to be built between medicine, teaching, and religion. Another trialogue. And he emphasizes, quote, we in the academic community of scholars need to rediscover this quest at the center for what it means to be human. So help us think in the future here at HDS, Arthur, what projects in teaching and conferencing, in caregiving and mentoring should we at the Divinity School be engaged in in the years ahead in our collective search for wisdom? Finally, speaking of the years ahead, let me close <laughs> with something my son wrote to me this week after reading Arthur Kleinman's What Really Matters and after teaching for the first time Judith Sherman's book, Say the Name, and growing up with her in his life. He speaks to perceptions some members of the next generation may have about our human condition. And he has some questions. And this is what he has for Arthur. Why is fire hot? Why is water wet? After they take everything, what else is left? What if it's only us and we are all afraid? Words live on after the prayer is prayed. I blame God and God blames me. And so we dance on eternally Say, never forget, but why is water wet? And why is this carousel what we can expect? So thank you, Arthur, for sharing with us your quest for wisdom. And please care for us as we carry on our own. It's an honor to respond together with my friend Evi Carrasco to this beautiful William James lecture by my colleague and friend Arthur Kleinman. Arthur speaks of the quest for wisdom, an ancient quest, sometimes sought but so often terribly compelled that scrolls itself out in many of the great epics of the world. This quest reflects, as he says, the imperative that comes to all of us, especially at times of crisis and loss. Gilgamesh, half his heart torn out, by the death of his beloved friend Enkidu, goes stripped and raving to the end of the earth, to the dawn of time itself, in search of the herb of immortality. He returns not with immortality, but with wisdom instead, a willingness finally to take up his rightful role as king and high priest in his own city of Oruk, the city he had ravaged in his hubris. Sophocles, aging Oedipus, finally accepting his own terrible biography, is taken at death into the bosom of the gods through, as Sophocles writes, the unlit door of earth. But the sanctification of wisdom does not come to him until he too has lost much that lay at his very core, including his wife and mother, his kingship, and his honor among humankind. For their part, the gods themselves searched for wisdom, although sometimes greedily, like Odin the Norse high god, a necromancer and magician, but even they pay a terrible price. Odin thirsts for a drink from the well of Mimir, a primordial being who dwells at one of the three roots of the world tree Yggdrasil, a draught that will fill Odin with wisdom, 
But in exchange, Mimir demands that Odin leave an eyeball there, remaining one-eyed one-eyed until the end of time at the Ragnarok. I learned from an Israeli friend who was a midwife's assistant that the Hebrew word for crisis and the word for birthing stool are one and the same, mashber. A trauma so great as the gradual loss of a beloved spouse culminating in her death is a passport to the abyss, what Arthur calls the morass of my feelings. And it clearly is also a mighty initiation, an occasion where the entire self must be destroyed and recreated. Love, Arthur says, had made it possible for me to endure the unendurable. The great psychologist Eric Erickson spoke of seven or eight distinct phases of psychological development for any individual fortunate enough to live out a long life. But prison activist and storyteller Michael Mead identified how, at these junctures, new selves are usually born, born at each mosh bear, out of a process and, of destruction and recreation so thoroughgoing as to be unrecognizable to the rational self as anything but disastrous. The loss of Joan caused Arthur to research his memories for guidance on how to live, as David reminded us. Raina Maria Rilke wrote of such a process in his first Duino elegy. And so I hold myself back and swallow the call note of my dark sobbing. Ah, uh, whom can we ever turn to in our need? Not angels, not humans. And already the knowing animals are aware that we really are not at home in our interpreted world. This brilliantly pierces the problem. How fond we are, especially here, of exegesis of interpretation and counterinterpretation, but sophisticated interpretation and even a subatomic understanding of the world's systematics does not make this world our home. It surely does little when the crisis descends when we are without help or hope and life becomes unendurable. Arthur's rediscovered Taiwanese journals from 1969 to 70 were filled with, as he tells us, quotations from his own group of meaningful philosophers and congenial thinkers. It's not surprising that of this distinguished group, it is William James who emerged and who remains as one of the leading guides in his search for wisdom and meaning. Author writes, James spoke, I felt the words strike home. In some uncanny and yet a not unordinary way, James shoved me. It was not exactly what he said, nor some specific answer he provided to my originating questions, but rather a feeling that emerged from the exchange that for me mattered most and propelled me along the way. Now it is to the urgency of this report of experience that I, and I think William James, would want to attend today. This is not a figure of speech. It's rather a direct and charismatic encounter in some way between a living scholar and his grief and a man who died over 100 years ago, trained as a physician, but living out his life as a psychologist and philosopher, and leaving legacies so profound in both fields that they are felt to this day. This experience came, as Arthur reports, in response to a dire exigency. I needed an intellectual interlocutor who could come right down into my experience and illuminate it from within. In other words, William James came to him, speaking in the varieties of religious experience, that the wild universe presents something for which we, with all our ideals and faithfulnesses, are needed to redeem. And in Talk to Teachers, James speaks of the solid meaning of life as always the same eternal thing, of the marriage of some unhabitual ideal, however special, with some man's or woman's pain. Here, I believe, are secular frameworks fail us, and we need to liberate ourselves from the empiricist, incomplete, and distancing qualifiers that characterize how we think about such relationships, how they're summoned, and how we understand them. To comprehend the multivalency of the encounter, we need instead to look to the traditions of rabbinic lineages at the time of the Amorayim, to Isaac Luria's inspiration of Chaim Vital in dreams long after the former had died to Ifa ceremonies invoking Yoruba ancestors who come to prophesy and to guide living communities, to the world of Sufi peers in Pakistan who come centuries after their lifetimes to initiate or instruct, to Dante led into hell by Virgil, or to St. John Chrysostom who interprets the Bible 
with St. Paul standing in his room at his shoulder four centuries after his death. Rilke also writes, angels, they say, don't know whether it is the living they're moving among or the dead. In such worlds, the dead are far from silent, and they're far from without means of helping the living or teaching us. It is a highly modern distinction that we make between the two worlds, living and dead, a highly modern distinction that we insist upon. William James was a man whom we could easily diagnose and dismiss, and many have, as having lived a hothouse bourgeois life, only one street away from where we now sit, in a gracious Cambridge dwelling and appointed to a comfortable Harvard tenure, surrounded by a loving family of equal brilliance, David, you left out Alice, and an endless network of leading scholars and writers. I'm just teasing him because he always doesn't leave out women in his uh, work. But he also spent years in paralyzing depression and related anxiety disorder, almost certainly genetic in origin, but almost entirely misunderstood in his day. Like Persephone, James had dual citizenship in the world of ordinary life and in hell. To insist, as we sometimes do in our legitimate advocacy against social justice, for social justice and for economic redistribution, that suffering is only legitimate when it is married to poverty or married to marginalization, cheapens the existential truth that hell dwelling is no respecter of persons. The privilege can lose hope and even leave this world and a trail of tears behind too early as easily as the disenfranchised. Despair is infinitely democratic in its grinding exigency. And that I think it is why, uh, this is why that was the work of, not of Husserl or of Kassirer, but of William James with his thick, still fresh descriptions of the gruesome phenomenology of depression or the shackling mechanisms of addiction with his open-ended generative theorizing of the process of conversion and recovery to a life worth living with his memorable and empathetic and respectful taxonomies of the once and twice born. It is why the work of William James was one of the great wellsprings of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The book was written when AA was still new, when the principles of surrender of one's will to a higher power and a complete moral inventory as a means to recovery from addiction were not hackneyed ideas, but lifelines to people in every walk of life whose lives had been train wrecked. William James' phenomenology was a source of the platform of Alcoholics Anonymous because he did so much more than interpret. He lived, he suffered, he investigated and understood and he told these things to the world, and therefore, he could offer wisdom and can continue to do so. Finally, author's talk reminds me that such wellsprings may be exactly what our students crave when they say that we fail them in moral education. It reminds me of what we might be robbing them of when we say that exposure to history, ideas, ideologies, theorems, and a tsunami of data will be enough for them to become successful human beings. It is not enough, and it's not even practical to teach them to investigate or to think critically that great idol of our educational process. These are vital capacities of an informed citizen, of any developed intellect, or of a future leader in any sphere, such as Harvard might produce. But when students say, as President Faust recently noted, of a startling survey of recent graduates of the college, that they valued its education deeply as far as it went, but missed any moral formation or attention to moral formation, then we need to introduce them not only to great principles, but also to great persons. Um, David closed with his son. I'm going to close with my daughter, Rosemary, my little daughter, Rosemary, who last year in third grade ended up with the short straw for the biography project. Other kids got Amelia Earhart and Martin Luther King Jr. Rosemary got Horace Mann. <laughs> of whom she had never heard, and we, her parents, knew precious little other than that he had given his name as a famous educator to an elite Manhattan high school. Rosemary discovered that Horace Mann, a Massachusetts native, had inaugurated public education for all children, even those who worked the fields as he had. He founded the first modern mental hospital, a predecessor of McLean Hospital. He proposed the abolition of slavery in the House of Representatives and debated Daniel Webster on the point long before the Civil War, 
losing a vote to abolish slavery by one vote. Shortly before he died, he gave a commencement address to the class of 1959 in Antioch College, of which he was the new president in Ohio. And Horace Mann said in a, in a, uh, a mandate, a statement that resonates so strongly with the one Arthur uh, shared with us from James, Horace Mann said, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. My little daughter Rosemary has remembered that and memorized it. And recently in fourth grade, she was asked to fill out a chart uh, for her life skills class and to list the members of her family. She listed dad, mom, sister, and Horace Mann. <laughs> I just saw this yesterday. Arthur's witness shows that we need to be sure that our students have a broader family, that they are introduced to their own rabbis, peers, sages, thinkers, and heroes, dead and alive. We need to give them spiritual guides and ancestors. We need to give them lineages. With those relationships in place, they have a better chance of discovering wisdom when they too, as all of us have, find themselves lost. They have a way of redeeming something of the wild universe. Thank you, David, and thank you, Arthur. Well, it's kind of hard to respond to two talks that were better than mine. Uh, and they should be up here to, to respond. Um, Look, um, uh, I think I really should open it up to uh, questions and just say that um, maybe the gist of the three talks is that we're all in this together, that the whole sense of hierarchy, paternalistic hierarchy, which dominated academic life in the past um, is gone. Um, I, I, I don't mean this in the sense of a pseudo-mutuality, that we don't have ranks, et cetera, but I mean the sense that we have authority held by some and questions held by others. The gist of what I was trying to say is that um, this experience uh, that I've recently gone through of loss and bereavement um, uh, pushed me back on the question that now both of my respondents have focused on, which was a sense that um, and this is, the, and this is uh, the wording I get from James, that there's a wildness in the universe. As I see it, that wildness is cold and indifferent and um, threatening. And um, at the end, um, there is a series of, uh, of losses that end with our personal being disappearing. And to um, redeem that, we have a number of things. Um, we have love. Um, we have um, wisdom. We have um, uh, the extraordinary institutions of which this is one example that we shouldn't take for granted. And maybe that's the last set of words I want to say. That, you know, I, I um, much of my work now is, has been focused on a very simple theme, which is um, uh, how is it that medical school takes some of the brightest students and over four years not only constructs dull doctors, but actually, actually complements their technical expertise with a disability when it comes to dealing with uh, human beings. And that's what I use that, that as a, a sense of where the university is headed. So my own fear is that our, our university, like all universities, will become dominated by a set of um, practical disciplines that are um, technically very, very rigorous, but that um, lack concern for the questions we raise today. And that over time, we will see a contraction of the disciplines we've assumed were at the very center of the university, that is the humanities and the interpretive social sciences. This was Weber's view. 
early uh, in the 20th century that uh, technical rationality would come to replace sentiment, tradition, rule of thumb, as he said, and would drive everything to the uh, sidelines. And we would live in an algorithmic state, in a, in a state that could generalize, could quantify with great efficiency, but it would lose what was um, crucial to human experience. And my own sense is that um, if we simply uh, let things go, as I'm sure we won't, um, that's where we'll, that's where we're headed. Um, my hope is that the extraordinary change that has occurred amongst us, a sense that you know we really have to fight for these things, that um, they they can't be taken for granted. They must be reconstructed. Um, that this will um, change uh, the direction we uh, seem to be headed in. This is, by the way, what gives me great um, uh, promise, a sense of great promise, side by side with concern, for the youngest generation of Chinese. There's been no generation in China like this generation. It's, after all, uh, largely a one-child uh, generation. And it is a generation that um, um, has faced up to, had to face up to, um, an entirely new world, a world remade in three decades, radically remade. Um, and it's a remarkable generation in many ways that simultaneously is materialistic and hyper-individualistic, like, like we are, and also, just like we are, questing for meanings. Um, how that generation will, will focus in a, in a still, um, I mean, will, will, will uh, proceed ahead in a still um, a repressive, deeply repressive polity, um, nobody knows. But uh, it's reason to be at least as optimistic as pessimistic when one looks at that generation. And the same thing when I look around us today. So if I had to point to one thing that is heartening about the paper I wrote, which when I wrote it for a medical journal, The Lancet, um, I didn't feel many heartening things uh, in response. It's the two responses that I've had from two esteemed colleagues, which were wonderful responses. You know, I've been at this institution 36 years um, here. I could count on both hands the number of responses I've had like that over that period of time. So that there's, a, there's something about what we need to do together. And, and if, um, if this session today helps with that, that's great. And I, I would turn things over to you and your questions. And don't feel that you need to query me, because you have two people who know a hell of a lot more than I do who commented uh, here. You want to come up? Come up. Come over here. Yes. Could you say something about the role of religious ritual in caretaking and our moral recovery? Um, you, want, you want to? Here I, have, I have two scholars of this subject who can. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I. I, I if you allow me, I, I, I think that um, this comes, my answer comes from the, really from the anthropology of religion, I think, which has insisted that um, several things that are often left out of religious studies be central to those studies. Um, so let, let me uh, go over them. One is embodiment, and um, embodiment in the sense that, um, um, that experiences, the experienced world of cultural meaning comes into the body and is felt in the body. Any of us who were uh, socialized in a religious tradition um, remember our visceral feeling when we participated in, um, in rituals. Um, I can, uh, I've moved, you know, you're looking at a pork-loving Jew. I, I've, I've moved far away from, my, uh, from, from the religion of my ancestors. But I, um, I can tell you that when I hear um, certain of, this, of, the, of the Sabbath 
um, chants that the chazan, that the cantor um, engages in, I can still feel well up within me the physiology of religion. So the religion is in the body, not just uh, um, in the mind. And that embodiment has the potential for transformation. And I think that's critical to religion. And I see ritual as um, 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 helping to um, get the process of change underway. So in, my, in, the, in the first book that I wrote, based on my research in Taiwan in the 1970s and, uh, uh, and late 60s, patients and healers in the context of culture, I tried to relate religious ritual um, of, uh, of um, shamanistic ritual in Taiwan to um, the practices of of physicians, of biomedicine, and of traditional Chinese medicine. And without going into the rehearsing the details here, I think you can make an argument on the parallel planes of cultural change and, um, and uh, physiological meaning, psychophysiological meaning. You can see um, how these work together so that there is a, a, a um, legit, legitimation of a particular state and then a transformation of that state on the level of um, symbols and on the level of physiology following those symbols. And then there is a reassertion of the new state and a, and a um, legitimation of it. Thousands, literally thousands of uh, studies in anthropology, psychiatry, psychology, a variety of fields have more or less come up with the same understanding in, uh, in that regard. And, and I think ritual is, um, is, um, is central um, to that. Have, you know, that's as far as I'm going to go, lest I fall into the problem that you'll remember that, um, um, uh, that um, when he created the first um, dictionary of the um, English language, Samuel Johnson made some errors. He was at a dinner party once, and a woman sitting across from him said, Dr. Johnson, why did you define the pastin of the horse as the knee of the horse? And he thought about it for a moment and said, ignorance, madam, pure ignorance. I, I don't want to enter that realm, so I... Uh... I want to thank you so much for a beautiful talk. Um, I've had lots of conversations with people who were mourning and they often ask, where do I go for meaning? What will sustain me? And many, many people do, in fact, land on the moral practice of offering their mourning in what uh, Professor Carrasco said in an active and public sense. And you said that you began to think of the offering of your mourning in terms of love and caregiving and also service to the institution. So I love this idea of taking one's mourning into the public sphere as a means for restoration. But I had a question in terms of the way in which you had described your kind of um, search through the, the authors whom you loved so much, the, the phenomenologists and the existential writers who speak in open-ended terms, um, processionally, agnostically, um, and pragmatically, I did want to know how you were right now, given the fact that these traditions always say this is an open question, how do you link together the theories that inspire you with respect to the act of work of mourning? You began to offer the answer when you said, we need to organize ourselves as a way of redeeming the liberal arts and the institution. And of course, I was thinking about Heidegger's question of technology as a kind of um, concern of yours, the technologization of the university. But I did want to hear more about how you put your service in the act of mourning together with the theory that you've been rereading. Well, um, uh, I don't know how far I want to go on this, but I, uh, it's a very personal um, uh, question. And you, uh, although I, I've opened myself up to the rightness of it by the fact that I've become public about it, um, there's a dimension of this that is, that is still uh, private for me. But 
let, let, let me put it this way, that we don't know a hell of a lot about uh, mourning and bereavement, which is an astonishing thing for me to tell you. Um, I'll give you some evidence of that. Um, it's only within the last 10 years that scientific studies of the experience of mourning have documented in our own society that um, sadness tied to loss is only one half of what mourning is about. And it's astonishing if you think that psychiatrists, psychologists, um, um, most others helping people who mourn in our society were unaware of the fact because there was no empirical evidence to, 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 to raise it up uh, to, to consciousness that yearning was as powerful a dimension of mourning as loss was. So I would say to begin with, um, I think I would want everyone who deals with mourning to be honest about the fact that our knowledge base is surprisingly limited and that our responses uh, tend to be, tend to the, to overestimate both what we know and what we can do. And then uh, we have this disabling quality I mentioned that comes out of our rational, uh, our technical rationality. So for example, one of the truly pornographic statements, and maybe pornographic is not even the right word, one of the truly um, terrible statements in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association is that after the death of a child or a spouse or a parent or any other loved one, if after two weeks, two weeks, you still experience sadness, yearning, uh, restlessness, appetite disturbance, sleep disturbance, et cetera, you have major depressive disorder, okay? I mean, that must be, that is, that is so obscene. The statement is so obscene. And somehow it's passed beneath the radar. That is, it's accepted so that uh, this is the way people are trained. In fact, those of you who are going to do CPE, uh, that is clinical pastoral education, are going to be trained in this idea that after two weeks of, uh, of, the, of, of, of these symptoms, if you don't, uh, if you're not better, you're, you're pathological at that time. I, I, you know, I, my own feeling is that this is incredibly dangerous. But I can tell you, it never surprises you to see where psychiatry is going. I mean, it's almost a, impossibly shocked anymore by psychiatry. And, um, and, I, and when I've presented this at psychiatric meetings, the most recent set of responses I got is that actually we should give antidepressants to people before they're bereaved so that when they enter the bereavement process, they wouldn't have to feel any pain at all, okay? <laughs> Which is when you, you know, when you, you think of it, um, what comment on, what, what kind of comment is that on the world we're in? Well, my fear is that that is precisely on the, you know, the world that we're in. So the very f set of questions you had about mourning, I think that's the important thing, to question it, to use those questions to engage and understand ourselves. But to claim uh, certainty and very detailed knowledge in this, in this regard, I think we should be extremely cautious about, about this. And I would say for those anthropologists in the audience, this is still the great subject, in my mind, for, um, for research. We have thousands of studies of mortuary practices, but just a handful of studies of actual mourning experiences. And still is a, is a great topic for the future. Any other questions? Or we're... Yes. Yeah. Uh, in early manhood, he nearly, or very nearly went insane. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, what was that about? Uh, what would the 20th and 1st century medicine say? Uh, uh, it can't have helped, I think, because his father was both a theologian and an alcoholic. Uh, what's your, what's yeah. your Well, um, we actually have in the audience a great James scholar, uh, Jim Kloppenberg, uh, from the history department, who probably can answer better than me, but just having read Robert Richardson, and taught Robert Richardson's fine biography of William James, this experience which uh, his father had called vastation, and, uh, and James sometimes reached for the same term, was a, um, an experience of, um, of what we would call a panic. Um, uh, not a panic disorder, but a, 
but a, but a, but a, but a, a um, anxiety attack, a panic attack. If you if you uh, look very carefully at the um, at the experience he describes, and you just pick up any textbook of psychiatry, you'll see it comes very close to a panic attack. But that panic attack uh, signals something else that was happening with James, and I think it was very appropriate that people refer to James's depression, because I think that was probably his, um, the, the underlying uh, uh, problem. But let me turn it over to Jim. Jim, you want to say? Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. My task is very simple to conclude a really stimulating hour and a half. I think we could go on for another hour and a half or maybe three more. Uh, thank you all, all the participants, and most of all, Arthur, thank you for a fine lecture and wonderful responses.